I really still just cannot believe we sailed ourselves from the UK to here and then took a lift and then a car and then a bike up to the mountains of the Sierra Nevada. It just never gets old that we, we did that. You joined us last week as we said goodbye to Aruba. Bye Aruba! And set off on the 520 nautical mile sail to Panama. We had no wind for the first two days, but soon the wind filled in and we were flying along. Well, it's definitely a spicy day out here. It's gusting well over 30 at the moment. Ah. However, due to Starlink deciding to conk out on us, we made an unexpected visit to Santa Marta in Colombia, which ended up being a flying visit as a weather update showed us some high winds coming our way. We crossed the crazy river Magdalena, then as darkness set, thunderstorms surrounded us. We made a quick decision to turn 90 degrees and head for shelter. This is the most convoluted way to the San Blas ever, but we are now dipping into Porto Valero for the night because thunderstorms are really predicted, like big thunderstorms, um, and that it's just silly us being voluntarily out in thunderstorms, so yeah changing the schedule again because that's what happens when you follow the weather. But our Furlex jammed and our Genoa was stuck flogging in 25 knots. Not ideal. Zach wrangled it with a line and we dropped anchor in a large bay in the darkness. Well, we are into Puerto Valara. Look at this place. It's like a little oasis. But we're in and the marina staff are so friendly. They helped us tie so many lines on board today. But yeah, we're in. And didn't tell you, we actually have three other boats here which we're friends with. So that's really nice. Well, all ones we met in Aruba. Yeah, all ones we met in Aruba. There's Moana, Freudestad and Isla. Uh, Isla. So that's really nice. We've got a bit of community here and we're just actually walking to a special lunch they put on for cruisers and it's five dollars. Four. Four dollars. Yeah. So cheap and you have to... A, a soup and like a main like fish, uh, yeah. rice, plantain thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, four dollars, you can't really go too wrong, can you? No, and I'm just, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I think you are too. Yeah. It wasn't the plan, but isn't that just sometimes the most exciting bit of it all? Yeah. Just diverting course and finding a beautiful place. It's really cool. Shanty. It's got a self-tucking jib, Zach. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's steel for sure. You can see little rust blotches. That's sick. I really like that. So we just got back from customs and immigration, and it was just the funniest experience of our life. It's like seven people all turned it's up. It's like for a party. This. It's like customs, immigration, biosecurity, port health. authority, health, and. Firstly, they said they were going to come at 5pm tonight, so we decided to go for a little dip in the pool when one of the marina staff came and said, they're going to be here in 15 minutes, so we sprinted back in our swimwear to the boat, got changed and went to this office, and then they started bringing out all these platters of food and lemonades for everyone. 
very interesting experience. Um, so much paperwork, but it was all in Spanish, so maybe we've signed our life away. I don't know, I signed like 10 bits of paper that I have no idea what they said, but we've had friends who've done the same, they said they're, they're fine. They're fine so. <laughs> so we trusted them, obviously. Anyway, then the Port Authority and health people came back to the boat, and they went round and asked us if we've got like rice and eggs and stuff like that. And at one point, the guy looked into the hammock that we've got of vegetables, and he picked up a sweet potato and had obviously been in there a while, a little bit mouldy. He picked it up, looked at it, looked at me, and then just like burn it down. <laughs> it was really funny. And then they took a selfie with us, um, and I put my thumbs up. I think to just show that they've been here. Yeah, it was weird. all very strange. I wasn't sure whether it was like a business thing or a personal thing. Not sure why I put my thumbs up to that, but yeah. And then they, we went back to the office, and then they said, you're all good and they keep our passports till tomorrow, so... Weird. Such an interesting experience. It took like an hour and a half for that. But, yeah, I guess we're checked into Columbia. So, yesterday we had a few issues with our furling headsail Genoa. I think most of the issue probably came from human error. But what we did, um, when we were taking it off the whisker pole and tacking it through our new inner force day, we've got to furl it mostly. And when we furled it, the lazy sheet, which for those who don't sail, is basically the the line that goes off the sail on the side that isn't being used, um, it's like lazy, lazy sheet. Um, that one got twisted when we started furling it because it was loose and I think it like wrapped around it funny and we couldn't get the whole thing off and I had to take both the sheets off, like f tuck all the sail in basically, furl it by hand, which is really difficult in those winds. And then when we came to pull the sail back out, I know when we came to put the sail back in when we were coming into port here, the line in the furling drum here this one which is the one that's working and our new install one just like got stuck i couldn't figure out what was happening we probably put a bit much force on it and it popped out of this basically how did that come out so normally there's a knot in it like that but the knot just came undone i think the knot must have been right at the end of where it should have been anyway and it just popped out it's not rotating wait Jammed. It can't turn half there. Ah, oh, okay. Every, everything really makes sense now. So, oh, that makes so much sense. Okay, so in the furling drum where I just showed you guys, where the line came out of, I couldn't get a knot in it, so I just coiled it around there and just thought that like that and a few turns around the furling drum would hold it all in place when it happens. But obviously when the sail was flapping that much, something came loose and then that thing that got loose worked its way into the bearing which caused another issue so we got this bit out here which i didn't know what was for um i was a bit worried that it sheared off but there's a little bit of corrosion there but it didn't shear off thankfully and i was just looking in this which is our uh, spare parts list and there's a little serial number on the bottom of there if you can see it uh five three nine two, well don't tell five. everyone our serial number they might take no, it's it just for this one bit <laughs> you never know um and after looking in here this is what holds the line in place it's a furling line lock and screw the more you know so um i need to open it back up and where the line goes through there this needs to be screwed through so it holds the line in place okay that makes a lot of sense <laughs> so i think yeah what happened is sail was flapping this screw was obviously a bit loose already. It's probably never been moved in its life, but mm. for a bit of abuse through the years, it's worked its way free. Um, and then that somehow, still can't quite figure this out, got stuck in the inner bearing. <laughs> so I think it got loose. And when the bearing turned, there's a little gap in the bearing that it got in and then just got jammed in there. And that's why we couldn't furl the thing all the way. We had no chance of fixing that out on the yeah, That's why it was all fully locked. I had to like yeah. go all the way around, but yeah, it's all, like, nothing's broken. Like, this is a bit scuffed up from, like, us, like, trying to furl it, but... It's great news. Yeah, it's good. Give me a high five for doing some research. Thank God for keeping this, but I don't know which owner kept this one, but... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I would have never have found that out otherwise. I've been there for hours. So this was in there. I'm not going to put it back in because it's going to be a bit to get out. But that was in there, along with the screw as well. <laughs> and so that's why it couldn't twist, but now... Ah, oh, interesting. There's no twisting. And where's it meant to be? It's meant to be. I still can't, like, it's still weird that it actually ended up in there. Well, I guess it's not, but... Oh, yeah. Is this, a, here, no, is this a little bit of damage it did? This so, little scuff, Zach? 
This little scuff here. Maybe, yeah. I think it got stuck in that bit and twisted around. It's meant to go on there like that. And then you'd like really push down and lock that down with the screw. Oh, interesting. Good job. We might end up pulling the dock off. <laughs> Good, I'm gonna come and take it back in now. Well, it came out really smoothly. Yeah, it did. Oh, it's so much nicer to furl a sail when there's not crazy wind and waves. Happy that was a good fix? Yeah, really good. We have finally got out the marina and we are exploring Colombia. And I am driving today and it is crazy on the roads. Why are you driving? Uh, because Zach's driving license conveniently expired. <laughs> Apparently I've been driving for 10 years and you've got to renew it in the UK when you've been driving for 10 years, which we didn't think about, but I've renewed it now and by the time we get to Panama I should have it again, so. Yeah, um, so yeah, I'm driving. We're actually heading about a two and a half hour drive up to Santa Marta um, and from Santa Marta we're going into the mountains uh, to a place called Minca, which is a backpacker's village. And we're doing something really different. We're going to stay at a hostel, I guess. It's like a nice hostel. I don't know if it's a hostel. Um, yeah, I guess you hostel. could call it a hostel, yeah. Um, we're in a room with seven bug beds. <laughs> but, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Started by a French guy who found this little like, slice of paradise up in the hills of the Sierra, Sierra Nevada. So we're going to go to some local excursions and maybe do a bit of hiking. And, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. It's something completely different. Um, and really feel like we're having an adventure. <laughs> yeah, we've got two nights at this place. And then have a night in Cartagena uh, with some friends. I think that's the plan at the moment. And then we'll return the car on Monday and check out weather windows to carry on, I think. But it's nice we're actually getting to explore a little bit of Columbia, if only it is for four days. We're on the final six kilometers into Minka at the moment. How's the drive been, Becca? <laughs> it's been good. It's been testing at times with people like swerving into you and yeah. It's got a lot, it's got a lot quieter now, which is really nice. Um, it's definitely a, a country of two contrasts in a lot of places. A lot of like really fancy hotels in some places and then really, really deprived areas with just like piles of rubbish, rubbish everywhere and yeah. Really, yeah. really poor areas but yeah. And loads of different sceneries as well. Like, this is super different now to what we've been it's having. Really large. Like, I don't even know what that animal is. It's, it's a like possum. a possum, isn't it? Oh no, no, it's an armadillo. I have no idea. <laughs> but it's just green and beautiful and oh, everything we wanted. The journey now is all like that. It's a little bit crazy with this road, but Becca's doing a fabulous job. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't long before we arrived in what can only be described as a hidden paradise. We are just at the most beautiful place I think I've ever been. And we came up the craziest road by motorbike. Super bumpy and like big, I was like holding on to the two lines. We'll try and film a bit of the road on the way back. Oh, I mean, I try. We'll, we'll maybe walk down so we can show you, but it was a really crazy windy road and this bike was <laughs> like holding on. We had helmets on glad we did but we just arrived at this just absolute paradise and we got upgraded which was incredible we were going to be in a, a room with seven others and now they booked out the dorm, I think yeah and now we're yeah. in our own private room and this just doesn't feel like real life
pain having bed. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I wanted to film the bed at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Should we just have this one instead? Yeah. And we'll just leave that one. Yeah, yeah. leave it made. <laughs> Just woken up, it's like 6.30 and honestly slept so well. It's silent up here, except for when the cicadas wake you up, but that is just so lovely. And it's cool, like I'm a bit chilly right now, I had a feather duvet, which was mental for the first time in over a year. And yeah, it's just so beautiful. I thought there was going to be clouds of mosquitoes up in the mountains, but I haven't seen any. I haven't had one land on me. I think there was more on the boat than there was here. So yeah, it's such a beautiful place. I'm, I'm still pinching myself for here. So we're leaving the place today to go for a bit of a hike. We are walking around to the coffee and cacao plantation just across the ridge here. And then we are gonna go to a hidden waterfall. Um, don't really know where we're going, but we're gonna find our way. <laughs> and we're joined by this chonk. This chonker. He's leading the way. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Go on then. Yeah, come on then. You're gonna lead the way with us, come on. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Go on. Wow, look at the house there. <laughs> Come! We're just sat in these really funky rocking chairs looking over Sans Marta and you can actually see the island that we sailed between when we came into Sans Marta which is awesome. Yeah, so that's the little island there and then that's the headland we sailed between those two. No, they're the different ones, they're not capybaras. We have come today to, I think it's called La Candoria and it's a cafe coffee and cacao plantation and they're going to give us a tour in a little bit about how coffee is grown, harvested and made and sold. So yeah, looking forward to learning a bit more about the culture and the industry here. Most of these 122 species are because they have been manipulated by the humans so they can get different species that can survive in different places. But here we are going to talk about two of them that are like the most important and processed in the world that are the Robusta and Arabicas. Robusta coffee is one of the most strong coffee because it's like 4-5% of caffeine in each bean so it will be very sour, bitter and strong. And the Arabicas coffee it's uh, in comparison less strong, contains 2-3% to of caffeine and it's going to be uh, a little bit more tasty, more sweet and less sour. So here in La Candelaria we're going to see many of the varieties of the Arabicas because Arabicas, the differences between the Robusta it's because Robusta grows from 100 meters above the sea level so it's really near to the sea level but the Arabicas needs 700 and above to grow it so in the altitude is how you can grow Arabicas so that's why the Colombian coffee, all of them, it's Arabicas because we grow it near to the Andes in the, in the altitudes 
We were then taken into the machine room, which was where the coffee beans were extracted from the pods, dried in the fire, and then prepared for the next step. Inside, there's like a hole, so you can put a hammer and it fits perfectly so you don't break them. Do you have to push down or do you just let the weight of the... Do you just let the weight down? So now we can clean the shell. Wow. So we put here. Now let's roast the beans. We put it below. And now we plug the machine because the mic the the machine, the engine, is from a microwave. <laughs> and these are the beans. Perfect. It smells delicious. You see all of the, the oily? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. caffeine. Ah, oh, that's caffeine. Yeah. Our brown that they have a stronger smell. Yeah. The powder inside here. Boiling water, do you know? I don't I don't know if you remember that the water was boiling. Yeah. So I turn it off and I wait some seconds until they start bub they're bubbling and boiling so we can use it now. Does it does it burn it if you use it when it's boiling? Yeah, yeah. it changed the fla the flavor. Oh. So we just finished the tour and it was honestly such a good tour. It was so thorough and interesting and the coffee at the end was so delicious. I think the biggest thing about that whole experience was how harrowing what he was saying about the fact that there's one massive corporation across Colombia which monopolizes the coffee industry um, and there was a lot of dodgy business ha that happened centuries ago that has just kind of set the foundation to prevent small coffee farms ex ever exporting their coffee. They, they've made it and so they control all the like basically ports and have all the yeah. officials in their pockets and so whenever any like place like this tries to export the coffee it's got to go through them and they've got to end up paying a ridiculous It was 25 percent tax and like 20 percent uh, shipping and basically there's absolutely zero profit for them to ever export their coffee and there probably never will be the whilst this big business is operating across Colombia. But That's why you never see any small coffee brands from Colombia outside of Colombia. It's always like owned by other corporations. Yeah, which is so sad. And he said, even Colombians aren't now drinking Colombian coffee because they import other countries' coffee and they can't export small farmers' coffee. So it highlights the need for people to buy local when you're here. Obviously, we'd love to leave a link down below for you to buy some of this beautiful coffee. You can't. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a really sad thing um, for farmers to be limited in their ability to make a profit from their livelihood. Mm -hmm. But hopefully we've just done a little bit by buying six bags or something. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to head to a waterfall now. Enjoy the banana. Have a quick dip. It's meant to be a hidden one. So we'll see how many people are there and yeah. see if we get lost getting there. <laughs> So we've just checked out the hotel, hostel, but now what we're going to do is climb up to the 360 viewpoint, um, spend a bit of time up there, and then we're going to go back down to Minka, get the car, and then go all the way to Cartagena this afternoon. So a lot to do today.
I think we are both very much in awe of all the sounds and sights in the the rainforest that we're in. It's actually incredible when it brings you this overwhelming sense of peace being here and just hearing the cicadas and the birds chirp and it's yeah incredibly peaceful up here. What just happened? It's very easy to lose the drone in a place like this. Yeah, it's all the same. Like, and you can't, I can't see where we are at all because all the vegetation here. Oh, we made it. <laughs> oh. We have made it to the top and what a scene we had. With views over the mountains and Santa Marta sitting far below, we honestly felt on top of the world. Now we go down the hill to Minka, which is the little town at the bottom, about a 40 minute walk. This is the road that we came up on. It's a bit, yeah. Treacherous <laughs> at points. Yeah, on a So yesterday we drove down from Minka all the way down to Cartagena, spent a night in an interesting hostel, didn't we? Uh, but it was all right. But this morning we've got a walking tour for three hours around the old city here, which we're really looking forward to. And then we're going back to the boat later. Despite not being city people, it was amazing to feel the buzz of Cartagena. Founded in 1533 by the Spanish commander Pedro de Heredia in the former location of the indigenous Caribbean Calamari village. The town was actually named after the port city of Cartagena in southeast Spain, where most of Heredia's sailors had resided. Now it's full of colour and music and the streets feel alive with South American culture.